Hey everybody, this is Carl General Mo Jian Bing. Today I'm talking about the Da Dao, which is a super iconic weapon from China's past. And as usual, this sword was sent to me by LK Chen for the purpose of a video review, and then I'll be passing it on to someone else. I'll start by talking about the history of the Da Dao, and then I'll talk about some of the features of this design, and then we'll get to my favorite part, which is going out and using it. I actually want to give a shout out to one of my sources for today's video, Ben Judkins, who researches Chinese martial arts and the history. He runs a blog called Kung Fu Tea, and in there he publishes articles on all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, but in particular, he has one on the social history of the Da Dao, and I'll leave a link to it in the description. But it's a really excellent article, and I recommend that anyone who is interested check it out. So starting from the name, Da Dao literally just means large, single-edged blade. So here, you know, we just have, sometimes people call them the big saber or the big chopper or the war sword or whatever, but it just means big, dao, and it is, right? It's a pretty hefty single-edged blade you can really chop with. Now, this sword was used in World War II. If we imagine World War II, you know, there's machine guns, submachine guns, artillery, tanks, you know, planes, and all this other stuff going on. Uh, so how does a sword fit into that context? In 1931, Japan invaded part of northern, northeastern China and in, founded a puppet state called Manchuria. And they even got the last emperor of the Qing dynasty and installed him as the puppet emperor, basically. So they had this separate state that they controlled called Manchuria in northeastern China. Leading up to World War II, you have this Japanese state of Manchuria right next to the Republic of China and in 1932 and 33, there's some skirmishing on the border, and the Da Dao uh, was present there. The 29th Army, which was led by Song Zheyuan, a famous general, there was a skirmish at Xifengkou, like this section of the Great Wall, there where it's recorded that they used the Da Dao against Japanese troops. Um, however, the more famous incident uh, that really solidified the Da Dao as an image of anti-Japanese resistance comes later in July 7th, 1937 at the, uh, in English it's called the Marco Polo Bridge Incident. Some scholars actually cite the Marco Polo Bridge Incident as the start of World War II. And this is because this is when Japan really started invading central China in earnest and trying to take out the ROC, that kind of stuff. We don't know exactly all the details of how it started, but there's a Japanese soldier who was missing and the Japanese army was trying to search the town of Wanping nearby to um, look for their soldier. Eventually the soldier comes back, but the Japanese still want to enter the town and the Chinese military keeps denying them entrance. And this boils into conflict. There was a famous last stand of soldiers with the Da Dao on this bridge. This really solidified the Da Dao in Chinese history as a symbol of nationalism and anti-Japanese resistance. There's even a big song that was written about it, which was about the Da Dao soldiers going and, you know, chopping up Japanese soldiers. Um, that's pretty graphic, but you have to remember that in many ways, World War II, we got to see some of the darkest parts of human civilization <laughs> during that time period. You know, China was an invaded country, so they were not shy about uh, attacking their enemy. However, as we all can imagine, a sword is not the most useful weapon on the battlefield. So what role did this really play in World War II? No general is going to want to have to give their army swords. They would rather just spend that extra weight on, you know, an extra gun or bullets. And this applies to both the Nationalist Republic of China Army as well as the uh, Communist Guerrilla Army. So they weren't just going around giving everybody a sword. However, during World War II, uh, all of Chinese society was mobilized to fight the invaders, as you can imagine. There is a lot of work that a military relies on, like logistical work and also paramilitary, like police work and all that kind of stuff. And the Da Dao played an essential role in that sphere. So not necessarily going and directly fighting the enemy, but being used as an implement to, you know, keep the peace. And there's also this darker side of the history to this weapon, which is that it was frequently used on Chinese people. Even though it's romanticized you know, fighting Japanese weapon, the reality is, is that deserters of the military 
could be executed with the sword. Criminals, they could be executed with the sword. So there's a tension in what the sword represents and what the things that it's been used for in the past. Now let's move on and talk about some of the details on this particular model by LK Chun. Number one, the blade is thick. It's very thick. So um, that gives it quite a bit of mass, makes it better for cutting. Also, um, that being said, it does have these fullers, which are, I th believe at this point they're mostly aesthetic. I mean, they're not taking out too much weight right there. Uh, this blade also swells towards the end, which once again is one more factor that brings the weight further out. So what you have is a pretty hefty blade, uh, quite tip heavy. In order to kind of balance things out, you have a little slightly longer handle. You have this big ring pummel. We all know that I love ring pummels here. <laughs> uh, the guard is a simple brass guard with these two uh, loops. This is a very common design of Da Dao during this period. So the grip on this sword is interesting because it's almost as thin as the base of the blade, um, which is pretty unique. And it does have this like red, I think it's cotton wrap on it. Um, it feels pretty comfortable. It's not like amazing, but it's definitely comfortable. And you, you do have really good edge alignment because of how flat it is. Also, I should mention that it has this, you know, modern silk like material red cloth tassel on the bottom of the ring pommel and when I was using this sword I did take this off. I believe that the reason that LK Chen put this on here is because in China because of this sword is associated with you know nationalism and anti-Japanese resistance and that kind of thing and red in general in China is a very auspicious color. It's kind of a way to respect what this sword represents. LK Chen also included a scabbard. This is a simple faux leather scabbard with these buttons and a like nylon strap on it. This is definitely practical. It's definitely useful. I would have liked to have seen a more accurate scabbard design, but that would probably increase the cost some. Uh, but that's just something that, you know, maybe LK Chen can consider in the future. Some would argue that the Da Dao is a more recent design, like, you know, in the Republican era. However, I would say that it pretty clearly stems from older designs. For example, if we look at the Huang Chao Li Qi Tu Shi, it has a sword called the Chuan Wei Dao, which was like the boat oar sword. It pretty clearly has a blade quite similar to this one. In addition to that, we have swords that were used during like the Taiping Rebellion. Those are also considered basically Da Dao. I actually think that we could take this blade design, this very broad, you know, blade that flares out towards the end, and it's very solid cutter. I suspect that we can actually push these broad blades perhaps all the way back to the Song Dynasty. I think it's very clear the uh, lineage that it has in Ming Dynasty pole arms. Many Ming Dynasty pole arms have blades quite similar to this. The question is how much evidence for the Yuan Dynasty do we have? Because we know that we have very wide choppy blades in the Song Dynasty. I haven't seen as much evidence for them in the Yuan Dynasty. If you guys know of any, go and you know, let me know. Uh, because I'd be very interested to see that and, you know, get that connection from Song potentially all the way up to, you know, 20th century. Now, unlike some of the swords that I've talked about before, we actually do know a lot about how this sword was used. We have actual video of soldiers training, as well as texts published on how to use the sword to fight mostly against the bayonet. This is primarily considered an anti-bayonet weapon. And as long as you can get past the tip of the bayonet, you're pretty much okay, but that's the hard part. That's <laughs> much easier said than done. I personally found that in two hands. This blade feels great and is quite maneuverable. However, it can get a little heavy with one hand.
All right, so that is the LK Chen World War II Da Bao. Now, I really like this blade. It's an amazing cutter. It was so much, it was a lot of fun to cut with this sword. And in addition to that, it's a super iconic weapon from Chinese history. So if you're interested in one, you know, you can go ahead and check out LK Chen's link down below. As always, thank you all for watching. Please subscribe and don't forget to stay sharp.